Um, yeah, well, <laughs> I was I was uh, born in New Zealand into a engineering family, and that was my role was to be a engineer probably in the family business. But I found engineering to be fairly boring. So my second degree is in organics and biodynamics. Back in the early 80s, that was not even called organics. Organics wasn't even a word. We called it companion planting and double digging and things like that. But while I was there, I met a viticulturalist, which I didn't know what a viticulturalist was, from Australia. So I ended up going to Australia and did a, a uh, degree in viticulture. And then I ended up doing a postgraduate in enology in Roseworthy, uh, which is in South Australia. So I lived in Australia for five years, came to California for the first time in 1989. I was a winemaker, assistant winemaker at a winery called Babbage Winery in New Zealand at the time. And then I went to Chile and was the first winemaker for a winery called Calatera. And I was on my way to France and long story, but I, I had an opportunity to meet Zelma Long, who was probably the most famous winemaker in California in the 80s and 90s. And at the time, she was winemaker at Simi Winery. And uh, she called me and offered me the job as winemaker. And wow. I stayed for, um, I was 27 and I stayed for... 14 years and but my big break really happened in 92 when LVMH who owned see me at the time made me the still wine blender for the US so I started traveling to Cloudy Bay, Cape Mantel in Australia, Rafino in Italy, Terrasas in Argentina and Roses in Portugal and that's sort of how I got started into what I do today. Well so it, it's so cool I want to talk about that just for a minute is is what people call flying winemaker, which, you know, you're making wine on three or four different continents, traveling all over. Uh, I mean, what's that? I mean, you're constantly going. I mean, I mean, give us just a bit of perspective of, I mean, you've been doing it for so long, but I mean, do you love it? I mean, what's, what, it seems amazing. Well, I, yeah, I was last, this time last week, I was in Chile, as you know, for the harvest. I, I think there's difference between being a corporate wine global winemaker and a individual flying winemaker so corporate winemaker i mean you're mandated you're there to blend for your country and then when i took over allied de mec which of course was the largest wine company in the world constellation and then allied de mec which is the largest wine company in the world we had 58 wineries in seven countries and so wow. that was a really big traveling uh job and then we got bought by jim beam so did the same thing with beam and then in 2008, when I went out on my own, we were purchased again by Constellation, but I decided to go on my own. So now, when I travel and consult, it's much more, it's hard to describe, it's, it's a real cultural thing. I, I, get more, I get as much out of the consulting as hopefully my client does, and I really enjoy the camaraderie. I, I always say to the, to the winemaker that I'm working with, dude, you know, when I retire, I'm coming to hang with you. I'm going to drink your wine cellar. I'm going to hang out with your family. And, and we're going to go to parties together because this, this, you know, if it works, it's going to be, it, it's, yeah, it's a long-term relationship. And, and right. even with LVMH today, it's a very funny story. I won't bore you with it, but the wine maker I was working with at Roses in Portugal is now the... Uh, president of Alma Viva in Chile, and I've remained friends with this guy since '92. And so these people pop up all around the place, and and he's just one example of of people that move cross country. You know, he's he speaks eight languages, and he's very you know. So these are not these are not your typical people that I get to right. work with, and um, so I love it. I just and I and I, and obviously it's only going to work if we make great wine, which is yeah. also cool. exactly. So tell us where. So where are you currently making wine? Under your own label. So obviously we have Northern California, but uh, but where else? Well, under our own label, obviously New Zealand and California, and then Chile and Argentina. Right. The other countries, um, this Argentinian wine is a big one. This is Chakras, which mm -hmm. is um, a wine that I make. It's, it's one of my favorite places. It's high altitude Melbeck. But the only other place I really work where I don't make wine for myself is Canada which I've been working at for the last, British Columbia, where I've been working for the last seven years. Wow. Australia, where I 
still consult a little bit in Australia and obviously um, I still have land down there from years and years ago right. and um, a little bit in Italy, but mainly um, New Zealand, Chile, Argentina and obviously Napa, Sonoma. So let's, so let's start there. So I know that's going to be the focus of today. So, so Napa, Sonoma, um, I'm going to show a quick map here. I know you're within the, um, the uh, Oakville. Oakville, uh, Oakville in, in, in Napa, and then Alexander Valley within Sonoma. So, uh, and the winery is in, is, is in uh, Healdsburg, is that right? Yeah, no, we're just north of Healdsburg, yeah. And we have a tasting room out in Dry Creek. Okay. So Healdsburg, just at the bottom of this map. Um, and then um, you can see different X's throughout the top portion there where some of the vineyards you're working with. So, so give us all just, I know you're really single vineyard focused. So, so just tell us a, a bit about your philosophy working in Northern California and how that sort of differentiates and separates yourself from a lot of your peers. Well, yeah, nationally and internationally, there are different rules in terms of blending and being able to label. I mean, that most people would be surprised about that. For instance, outside of the US, it's an 85% rule. So only 85% of the wine has to be Cabernet from Maipo, or for instance, the other fifteen percent could be non-vintage, could be another appellation, another variety, whatever. But here in California, we have very difficult rules. Um, our non-vintage can only be five percent. If you want to be appellated, it still has to be eighty-five percent, but twenty-five percent can be not Napa Valley Cabernet. It's really, really complicated. So instead of getting into this whole who said she said, I decided that I'm just going to keep the story really simple. One vineyard, one vintage, one variety, and vegan. So vegan is the other big thing. And people will be surprised about how important vegan is to winemaking because basically that means that we're not using any additives for fining. And predominantly, I mean, even today, most French wines would still use egg whites. Mm -hmm. And it's still a lot of it is used in California winemaking too. But not just eggs. There's eyes and glass, which is the traditional form of of clarification or gelatin or right. milk milk is a really good one <laughs> so yeah. um you know things like that we just we just I, I just try and get it as close as possible to the vine so you know and that's i think for the customer that's great too because dealing with single vineyards you're always told that that's the best you know if you can go touch the place your wine came from you know that's kind of the best case scenario so the fact mm. that all of your wines are single vineyards I mean, it kind of takes a lot of the guesswork out and, you know, it puts your wines, in my opinion, even your entry-level wines, kind of at the top of the run. Maybe. I could argue that both ways. I would, I would also say if the vineyard, if it's not the right vineyard, it could make some of the best, uh, some of the worst wine in the world. I think the beautiful thing about the way we're appellated in California is that I can pick up a stone and throw it and I'm in a different soil type. And because of that, these earthquake zones are really important. This is why New Zealand, Chile, Argentina, and California is where I work, is because the earthquakes have caused all these different um, soil types. And so we can get a hell of a lot of complexity within a small area. And that's right. how you make great wine, by making the wine as complex as possible. And you can see that in the photo that you're showing right now, not where that brown spot is, but below that you'll see a, a green area which is um, the Yeoman Vineyard, and then right above it. I mean, we're talking about two-acre slots. Um, the vineyard right above it, you can see that it's planted. I mean, we're talking about two-acre slots here, three-acre slots, and the, and the diversity is just massive, and that's how you make more complex wines. Um, so the other cool thing, though, or the really important thing that people don't understand is the... Is the um, longevity like for instance i don't work with any vineyard that i haven't been working with for more than 15 years i don't put any wine under my own label without being it having worked on it for 15 years and because of that you know i know how these vineyards are going to react in good years and bad years i know their longevity most of the we're looking at the forefathers vineyard right now and i've been working on that vineyard since 1992 wow. and so you know, I thought it was funny that a very famous magazine came out and said the 40 best winemakers under 40 years old. Well, those wines are exactly not what I'm interested in. I want to drink 50, you know, I want, I want them to do the, the 50 best winemakers over 50. And then you see what you get. Yeah. Because then you know how those wines are going to react. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm more of a traditionalist. I mean, look, 
I'm 58 years old, man. The average white guy lives to 84. I've got 17,900 days to live. So every day I have to drink a good bottle of wine. Yeah. So I want to know how that wine's going to react over time. And I find, I find that fascinating. You know, I find that interesting. Have the historical perspective and have continuity, et cetera. So we, when, uh, when we first connected, we were chatting for a few minutes about uh, the current state of you know, California vineyard management and, and, and the drought situation. Um, some people might have missed that if they tuned in late. But tell us, just reiterate just quickly about you know, the current situation with, uh, with rainfall, but also, also into dry farming, because I know your, your big focus is in dry farming. So how do you accomplish that during difficult years like this? dry farming is really difficult you've got to be in the right spot for a start i mean our vineyard in chile that um is down on the 35th parallel we dry farm uh, but dry farming in and where we are here in the alexander valley in napa is very difficult so one of the predominant the greatest vineyard that i have dry farmed is in oakville and that vineyard now is 50 years old and so it's a monster. I mean, it's been dry farmed for probably 49 years out of the, they probably only irrigated it the first year they planted it. Um, but what dry farming means is it's true terroir. You only get terroir from dry farming. When we invented irrigation, we changed terroir because that's not a, you know, that's an imported product. So you're changing the profile of the soil. You're changing the way the vines grow. And so true terroir is really only done with dry farming. Um, but the drought here is significant. And certainly if you look at, you know, the 15-year average, which is what we look at, it's phenomenally dry. Uh, if you look at over the 30-year average, which is the other, the other step, we're looking even drier. So... Um, this Lone Tree vineyard you're looking at now is dry farmed. You can see there's actually a black hose under those vines. Yeah, I can see there. But we haven't turned that. That vineyard has not had water for 12 years now because we just wow. don't have water. And uh, that's, But the reason why that vineyard works is that, that mountain that you see in the background there, that's Mount St. Helena, and we're facing east. So you can see that the sun, is. this vineyard is exposed in the morning and has no sun in the afternoon. So... That's one way that we can mitigate the amount of water that is needed on this vineyard. The second thing, and you can't see it because I didn't take the vineyard early enough in the morning, the photo early enough in the morning, is that you would normally have a big fog layer down there in the valley, and these vines get off to a really late start. But as the fog burns off, um, uh, uh, so we get off to a late start here on the Lone Tree Vineyard, but as the season progresses, we catch up because the lower piece of the vineyard is stuck in fog and we're not. But dry farming is going to become more and more important. So the big, the big, big deal is the rootstock. So we're using the two rootstocks that I'm focusing on, our 110R and 1103 Polson. And both of these vineyards, both of these rootstocks are deep-rooted. 110R is very slow, so it's slow to get started. It probably takes an extra year to, to create a good foundation for the vine because it's going so deep. And then 1103 Polson... Is a little bit more shallow, but it has stronger roots. And so those are the two rootstocks that we're looking at. Now, if we have nematodes or, uh, or other maggotoros as we do in Chile, I will change the rootstock a little bit. But basically, those are the two main drought-resistant rootstocks, which are quite different to the rootstocks that we were using 10 years ago. So, you know, and just to summarize it, because people just don't think about this or, or know about the complexities, but, you know, winemaking especially in northern california now i mean you're you're it's all site selection so you're picking east facing so cooler cooler vineyards um rootstock selection i know you deal with mass selection for the vines so you know all these methods you know and, and that makes all the difference you know i mean it's uh and, and people don't realize the complexities and the choices that you have to go through every single day i mean i think it's just hearing you talk for a few minutes gives us just a, a, a tiny glimpse into the complexities of it David, I think that what you what we alluded to earlier about people have been working on vineyards for a long time, there's a lot to be said for history. And I find mass selections far more interesting than clones right. or marsal, as we call them in, in, self, in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And these old mass selections were selected for a reason by old growers. And what they would do is they'd take, you know, they'd take a cane like this in the winter and three buds and they'd make a cutting, wind it up in a 
in a bundle and throw it in a cool room. And then in the spring, they get a knife and they take the chip, they, they take this bud out with a knife, they chip it out and they go to the rootstock, they make a tea, peel it back, slip the bud and they can grow Chardonnay. And that's what a mass selection was. And it was a random selection across the whole vineyard of vines that they desired or characteristics that they desired. So those wines taste completely different. Like when we drink Chardonnay, you know, we have the singing tree Chardonnay that's made 100% from old mass selections. Right. Whereas most Chardonnay today is described as white peach. If I get another Chardonnay that tastes like a white peach, I'm going to scream <laughs> because they're all made from clones. And I don't care if they're Dijon clones or UC Davis clone or Espaguette clones. They all taste the same because the definition of a clone is it all comes from one plant. Right, so and nice. so the diversity, the plant diversity is not that extreme. And this is why California Cabernet, California Chardonnay, and now California Pinot are all become relatively boring. I mean, this is why you need to seek out the pomade and the swan, etc., for Pinot or for Chardonnay, you want to find the Wente or the C or the Rude or, you know, some of these selections. And then in Cabernet, we talk about, you know, Turkey Hill and other, and other mass selections like that. So, these are the things that make wines interesting. And it's just like, you know, people think, oh, concrete, man. Let's make wine in concrete. That sounds cool. Guess what? We were doing, my first five vintages were all made in concrete. Yeah. This is not new. <laughs> so there's a lot to be said for tradition. Yeah, and, that's, exactly. that, and only with that tradition, uh, that, that tradition comes with history. And, you know, luckily I'm an old bugger. So I know a lot of the history because I've learned from, a lot of people have gone on before me. And so people of my generation, winemakers of my age, I find this is why I like to hang out with them because yeah. they have a different perspective of history than me, depending on where they're from. Right, and exactly. so this is where culture comes in. And yeah, there's nothing to be said for sitting around the dinner table at the end of the evening, drinking and, you know, BSing with a, with a fellow winemaker who's, who's of the equivalent age, who's got just as many bad stories as you do. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You can swap bad stories and yeah. <laughs> Hopefully your solutions maybe down the road. So, well, yeah, that's so uh, we, we showed there the, the singing tree. Uh, I just wanted to quickly show the, uh, the daughter's labels here, which are some of the most popular wines that we sell in our portfolio. Uh, we don't really need to, to do any selling on these because they are selling themselves quite well. Um, but for those who don't know, these, uh, these, these labels are named after your daughters. So uh, I think that's really cool. Well, not not really. They they the, the daughters participate, and this is this has been a real blessing for a father to work with their daughters because those fathers who are watching understand this that daughters can be a little bit difficult, especially between the ages of thirteen and nineteen. And so, as um, we have an annual photo, these are in some of our dogs there. You see, but um, I don't make wines with my sons, but I make wines with my daughters. And Chelsea is the one on the back left there in a black singlet. She, um, she was the first one. And I was explaining to my children back in 2000 that when I was living in Chile, uh, when Pinochet was in power, um, you know, he was the dictator. He could cut oil, electricity, food, whatever. So he'd often cut power off. And so I was explaining to my children, you know, you can make wine without electricity. So each year we make a barrel of wine called five gold hands, meaning Goldschmidt, unplugged, you know, wine without electricity. Yeah, so we still make that one barrel a year. And Chelsea in 2002 said, you know, can I make wine with you? And so that's how we got started. So we started making wine from that vineyard that you see the kids standing in right now. And Chelsea's the second on the left there. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's how it got started. And then Catherine wanted to be involved. And then finally Hillary. And uh, so they're each different. Chelsea's the Merlot. Catherine and, and Hillary are both Cabernets, one's from the Alexander Valley and one's from um, Oakville. But you'll notice the label on the left there, Catherine, she faces a different direction to the other two. Oh, right. Because middle children, <laughs> for those who are listening who are middle children will deny this, but I find middle children very creative, energetic manipulate the truth etc now middle children will deny that and say of no we're the, we're the lovers the glue we stick with the peacemakers yeah you're manipulating everybody that's right. how you get that done on both sides yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. so when i'm in a public arena I, no 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 she thinks outside the box and she's creative and innovative etc so that's why she faces a different direction but the truth is she's the middle daughter 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's cool. And those wines are spectacular. I mean, there's great examples, each one uh, of, of their location. But I really want to get into a bit more on uh, Yeoman and then uh, Game Ranch. So tell us a bit about Yeoman. I, I think I have a, a map uh, I'll try to find here in a second. But two labels, explain the difference between them and give us just a bit on the Yeoman. Well, we do, we do two wines. We do one's called Yeoman, one's called Game Ranch. You've got the Yeoman up, and here's the Game Ranch. It's got mm -hmm. a black, it's a black label version. And we started, we started these two wines because of a historical tasting that I did in 2000 with 72 sommeliers, and we had five winemakers from there, from five winemakers from the Alexander Valley, ten wines on the table, 72 psalms. Each winemaker spoke, and then we asked the 72 psalms to pick the five Nappers from the five Alexander Valleys, and guess what? Not sure. one sommelier could do it. Wow, and we we did a follow up tasting. We did Merlot versus Cabernet, and the sommeliers couldn't tell, couldn't pick the five Merlots from the five Cabernets either. So I don't know how wine writers do it every day. It's spectacular. <laughs> anyway, so I make two wines exactly the same. I, now these are not normal wines. Okay, so Yeoman that we were originally talking about. Yeoman is one of the oldest east facing hillsides that I know of in the Alexander Valley. I've been in the Alexander Valley now for thirty two years, and the Yeoman Vineyard is the bee's knees. And um, it's a special site, and so is the. So you can see that it's a terrace, old vine, sandy loam, uh, gravelly loam soil, and uh, yeah, just a spectacular, spectacular vineyard. Um, and then over in the in the Napa Valley, we have an east face. It's there's only one knoll in all of Oakville. You've got uh, Tokalone to the west and Pritchett Hill to the east. And there's not one hill in the middle of, of Oakville except for this one. So we are the east-facing slope on that little hill right in front of Plum Jack and Groth. And behind us is Tench and Screaming Eagle and, and Silver Oak. So uh, these are not special vineyards. I do them side by side. I normally pour them blind to the prospective sommelier when I'm out on the road and, and ask them to pick. You know, I pour them three glasses, two of one and one of the other, and I ask them to pick which two are the same. Believe it or not, 75% of them get it wrong. And then I ask them which one they like. They normally like the one on the right, and I unveil, and it's always the yeoman. So, yeah, it, it people don't let other people tell you what to drink. I mean, there's only one person in the world that knows how you taste wine, and that's you. And that's the same thing with, with um, you know, when was the last time Robert Parker sat down and had dinner with you? I mean, and you've got to understand the culture and um, – uh, where you live and who you're with and, and where you are at the time of drinking because all of these things influence how a wine tastes. But Yeoman is really classic. Alexander Valley is red fruit, good acidity, you know, red berry, blue, blue, black cherry. That's the Alexander Valley profile. And Napa Valley tends to be um, black cherry um, plum. So you get a darker fruit element with Napa. So I find the yeoman is spectacular because you get more black fruit with the yeoman purely because of the age and of the exposure. But when I'm having dinner, I always drink Alexander Valley because Alexander Valley always has better acidity. You know, we have lower alcohol in the Alexander Valley typically because we pick earlier. Napa Valley is hotter than, um, than the Alexander Valley. So I typically pick the Alexander Valley after I've picked Oakville. And then the really... Um, Special wine is that black label. We call it Plus, so Game Ranch Plus and Yeoman Plus. And on the front label, it talks about four of the things that are uniquely different. And so it says topography, harvest, um, the technique, and, and how limited it is. So we only make we make uh, four, five, six barrels of this wine in, a, in each year, and I only ever end up bottling three or four of them. So usually 100 cases of each. But... If you think about the best value Oakville in the market, you've got Oakville, you've got Game Ranch up there. Now, the best value Oakville on the market is, as according to Suckling and the Wine Spectator, of course, is Hillary. I mean, you can't beat an Oakville wine for 55 bucks retail. The third, the third best value wine in all of Oakville is Game Ranch. And I would put, I bet you the plus at 150 bucks is still up there in the top 10 best value wines. So even though it's one of them, one of my second most expensive wine that I make, it's still an awesome, awesome value when it comes to comparing against the rest of Oakville. The four differences, well, mainly I, the main difference that's easy to explain is it's complicated, but the, the main difference is it's the outside rows of the vineyard because the outside rows receive more water, therefore they've got more vigor 
and they have less crop because of the vigor they blow flowers so that not all the clusters form gotcha so when i bring the wine in i can extract it a lot more aggressively so it's maximum extraction on tiny tiny berries at low yield and then i leave it in barrel for a year longer than i do anything else and the tricky thing is how i create the nose because when I worked at Grange in Australia years and years ago, for those who don't know, Grange is the top Syrah probably in the world, yeah. especially the new world. There's a technique that they use there that really, really specific. And I, as usual, you know, I, I manipulated that technique to suit my own needs. Mm -hmm. And I put that into this wine. Um, unfortunately, we, I can't really talk about it because I don't want to get sued. Um, but yeah, it's a really interesting technique. And, and what happens is when you get that, what happens is when you, when you drink a wine that's been in barrel for four years, when you smell it, you get more of the volatiles coming off. So a little bit more ethyl acetate. When you drink it, you get more of acetic acid. But using this technique, you cannot see those profiles at all. The wine just does not age. And you know how wines move from purple to red to brown to orange? Yeah. I can show you, like, you know, winemakers get asked all the time, hey, man, how long is your wine going to last for? And I go, well, 25 years. And they go, well, how the hell do you know? Well, I can show you wine I made from that vineyard 25 years ago using the same technique. Yeah. You know, some winemakers have only been in the business for 10 years. How long is your wine going to last? 25 years. Well, show me. You haven't even made a wine for 25 years, let alone right. from the same vineyard. So how do you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, unless you've done it. it, it, it but that's what's, you know, what's so cool to me is that, you know, your, your wines are just unique, and but they have, you know, just such life, even with, uh, you know, I think the, the pluses are like 40 some months in, in barrel and they're, it just, just doesn't show it. it is, they're just so bright, but you get that depth and the complexity. Uh, the wines are just incredible. Well, thanks. Drink more. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a mixed case. You can send it on down. Yeah, oh, drink oh. more, drink more and post more. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's hard. You know, the funnel for distribution is getting really, is really tough. And that's why I'm very honored to work with Tuton. I mean, they are one of the few, you know, family distributors that really get it. I mean, Tuton is hot, man. And I just, I love being friends with you guys. And, that, and it's been a good, rela a young relationship of about eight, nine years now, but it's, it's, a, it's a great relationship. And I, um, I can't thank Tuton enough because for mid-sized companies, we're, I'm being generous and then I'm a mid-sized company. I'm more small than I am mid, but we are in the three-tier system, which a lot of my friends, unfortunately, are, are not anymore due to COVID. With the consolidation of distribution and the way businesses are run, I think it's very hard for the consumer these days to realize what they're putting in their basket. I mean, when you walk into a large supermarket store here in, in um, Healdsburg, there's a, there's a stack of wine. There's 20 different wines there. They're all different flavors and different brands, but guess what? They're all from the same company. Right. Exactly. You just don't know. Yeah. And so it's hard for companies like us to get a foothold in those stores. Uh, and, uh, you know, because the impulse buy is such an important aspect of shopping these days, especially when you're trying to get in and out and taking a little bit of time and finding the Catherine on the shelf. I mean, Catherine is, is like the number four selling Cabernet over 15 bucks here in California. Yeah. And, um, but it's on the shelf. It's not stacked. And so it's amazing that that wine, that this wine has been able to like sell through. I, I'm always amazed that people have such a ma massive amount of choice when they walk into the store and yet that wine sells on its own merit. So we're very fortunate to have support of, of uh, just distributors like Tuton who, who can manage that process for us. Yeah, no, exactly. It's, it's just getting it, it's getting it in front of people and it's, it turned, it's really turned into a cult classic, these wines. I mean, uh, it's, once somebody experiences it, they're hooked. It's, uh, and, and for the price point, it's unbelievable. So, um, no, it's, it's, it's an honor. I, I know just speaking for, uh, for uh, Guillaume and, and Maxime, it's an honor to work with you and, uh, and it, it's just great to take, uh, you know, 30 minutes and, and just learn a bit more about the wines and, and just, you know, it's kind of scratch the surface of the complexities and, and everything that go into it. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's cool. We didn't even get to talk about it, but maybe next time we can talk about pruning and all this. <laughs> that's an, uh, yeah. Pruning in Argentina, North, South and altitude. That's what I find interesting. And yeah. this is a vineyard at altitude. So, uh, I, I am a vineyard guy and I, I love being out there. But, um, yeah, such a dynamic and exciting industry. I mean, 
you know, we, we say the dickhead factor in the wine industry is relatively low. Uh, you know, and we enjoy hanging out with each other. I mean, winemakers and viticulturists love hanging out with each other. I, I'm not sure if a bunch of accountants would say the same thing or, um, <laughs> or in my, my and, you know, history of, of course, engineers, having dinner with engineers, yeah. not so much fun, you know. <laughs> like two of my children are engineers as well. You know? Yeah. Well, and you, and you, you have the vineyard dogs, which I love too. So uh, yeah, we got a lot of dogs. We have a lot of. <laughs> so, yeah. anyways, I'll. Uh, we're getting towards the end of our time, but uh, I just want to thank you again for uh, for giving us uh, a bit of your time and, and knowledge today, Nick. And we're going to go out there and uh, continue to uh, sell and promote them as we always do. But keep up the great work. I know Mother Nature isn't helping you, but uh, fight the good fights and uh, keep going, man. Every year is a different year, David, and, and I can still tell you about the vintage of 1988. If you tell me the birth year of my children, I can tell you what the vintage was like. I can't remember the birth year of my children, but I can tell you exactly what the vintage was like. So, yeah, yeah time, <laughs> time is a really a, – everything I do is based on vintage. So yeah, exactly. if it wasn't something that was a challenge, I would probably forget the vintage. Yeah. So I want to uh, remind everyone who's, uh, who's still with us of our conversation next week. Uh, I'm sure you, Nick, uh, have crossed roads with uh, Susanna Balbo uh, at one point or another. Just so, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So next week, uh, actually two weeks from now, because we're doing every other week now. So uh, Thursday, April 22nd, same time, 1 p.m. Eastern time, we're going to be going live with Susanna Balbo from Argentina. So that's going to be a real cool one as well. So we're going to talk about her wines. Of course, she's the founder of uh, Creos and Ben Marco and Susana Balbo Signature and all of her, her wines. So we're going to do a deep dive in Argentina next week. But uh, Nick, thank you again. We'll sign off for now. And uh, everyone have a great rest of the week. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks.